Hello, uh, welcome to our live at Obsidian Wine Co. Um, and tonight we're looking at uh, oxygen, oak, and aging, obviously as it relates to wines. Um, for those of you that are with us for the first time, thanks for joining us. Uh, for the masochists that are coming back for a second, uh, a second dip, um, thanks again. Um, we'll try to torture you adequately. Um, so we're dealing with a couple of uh, things here and doing things in, in what may seem a little unconventional to you uh, in terms of the tasting order. Uh, some of you may have one of these wines, some of you may have all of these wines, and then again, some of you may have none of these wines and be following along, and we're hoping that you're tasting something that you like, if that's the case. Uh, if for some strange reason you haven't opened them already, we encourage you to do so now, and don't wait for us to tell you to uh, drink them or taste them. Um, you can follow along, certainly, and, and, and uh, we'll go through them one at a time, uh, but the idea is for you to be in, in, enjoying yourselves and... Um, we, we believe that this experience is far more enjoyable with a glass of wine in your hand. Um, so this evening, we've chosen three of our wines that have uh, a variety of ages on them, um, all off of our Poseidon vineyard. So we have one Chardonnay, the uh, Estate 2016, and then we have two Pinot Noirs. Uh, we have a 2010, which is... Um, uh, an older iteration of our estate Pinot Noir, which at that point we called the Molnar family Pinot Noir, and then the 2008 Primos Hill Pinot Noir, which was under what at that point was the Casimir and Blaze label, and I'll let Peter tell you about that maybe later. Um, so we're going to start in, in the reverse order of, of, of how I describe them to you, uh, but first I just wanted to let you know um, if you have a question throughout by all means, please drop it into the chat and um, JJ, our uh, producer extraordinaire, will lob them up to us and we will answer them along the way. We'll also have a chance at the end for a little Q&A um, and you can use the uh, raise a hand feature that's found in your reactions um, button on the, on the toolbar at the bottom. If you raise your hand, um, we'll ping you and you can um, get on the screen and, and we'll, we'll be able to hear you and you can and ask that question. So with that in mind, just know that we are recording this. So if you're on it, you're getting recorded too. We hope that's okay with you. We'll try and get your good side. Um, and I suppose with that in mind, um, I will turn it over a little bit here to our, uh, our founder, uh, one of our founders, Peter Molnar, and he can do a little, uh, let's say deep dive into, um, oxygen, oak, and aging. Peter. There we go. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's great to have you. Um, I just wanted to note, um, before we get started, if you're in Texas or the East, you can use your corks to make a small bonfire to stay warm after you're done with all this. So <laughs> just a tip from the, the sunny West Coast. But anyhow, um, it's, it's, uh, it's fun to dive into these. It's one of the interesting things about COVID that we suddenly have all this time. Where else on Friday afternoon would you actually sit down and look at your computer to hear about oak aging and um, oxygen? But um, it's a great topic because that's exactly what we think about all the way through our winemaking. And some of it's super complicated, but I'll be honest with you, a lot of the science is just catching up with the practices of how people have made wine for hundreds and even thousands of years. Um, so, so a lot of what we're talking about here, there's no, I, I want to be very clear, there's no right answer here. Um, we just use the science and our experience to illuminate what we think is already going on. So our palates are super, super sensitive. Like we have millions of years of biology in our favor. Your palate is, you know, just thousands and thousands of millions of sensors. Um, everybody tastes wine a bit differently everybody, where they are, how their body temperature is, the makeup of their enzymes in their saliva, all these things influence how we experience wine. And none of that is important. The only thing that's important is whether you enjoy the wine and how you enjoy the wine. So what we're, we thought we'd bring this topic up is just to think about what are the factors that go into how wine evolves from the very beginning when we bring it in from the field to when we age in the barrels and when it's aging in your cellar and even aging in your glass. One of the things that's most interesting, I think all of us who love wine, um, is that you open a bottle and in the first glass you have is tastes one way and half an hour or an hour later, it tastes a different way. And that evolution in the glass really 
from the very beginning. So I'm going to start with JJ. Can you show up the picture of the vineyard um, in a second? Well, so what we're going to talk about very briefly is we're going to do a chalk talk here. Can I, can I do that? JJ? Sounds like um, somebody might be. So very, very basically, I'm going to make this simple. This is like this is the early version of the NFL halftime show, <laughs> X's and O's, Tell if you guys us, remember. Coach. Tell exactly, exactly. <laughs> this is our chalk talk when you're down 50 to zero in the, in the, in, after the first half. Um, <laughs> we have two major components in grapes, and one of them is sugar. I'm going to do that in red because it's, it's um, a warmer color. And the other one is acid, which I'm going to do in blue. And as grapes ripen, acids break down and sugars accumulate. And we always try to find that perfect middle balance where every year where we pick that. If you don't have enough sugar, it's not gonna be a robust wine. It won't have enough depth. If you don't have enough acid, it, the wine's gonna be flat. And so if you wait too long, you have a hot, heavy wine with no acid, right? Cause the acid is down here. If you pick too early, it's gonna be super acidic and it's not gonna have very much um, body or weight to the wine. So, but one of these is, and this is the aging, is this decision is already critical because acid is one of the key components of what makes wine age over time. Natural so preservative. It's a natural preservative. So there are different types of acid. So acid can be um, the, the grape acid, which is tartaric acid, or total acid, we'll just call it that, to make it simple. And then we also have tannins. And tannins are long chain acids that are the kind of a tannin is what makes your mouth pucker when you have a lot of it. Some fruits have of it, have it, um, and wine certainly has it, like big wines like, Nap like Cabernets will often have that. So that's, a, that's, that's chalky, if I made that chalky feeling that you get on the roof of your mouth or the top of your tongue, specifically with a Cabernet, but with any of those heartier reds, that's, uh, that's a tannic acidity that you're feeling. So let's, um, let's start tasting the wines and start talking about that. So- Oh, darn. Our, our site where we are down by the coast, very, very back bay, the bottom of uh, Napa Carneros is the coldest, coolest, foggiest site in the Carneros region. We are literally right at the confluence of, um, of Carneros Creek and the Napa River. So we get great acidity in these wines already. Um, in fact, we, we, we farm for a number, we, we planted that vineyard originally for sparkling wine, which needs very high acidity. So. We're very lucky in that way. So our call is to wait long enough for the fruit to develop, but still have enough acid. This is why you can have a Pinot that's 10, 12, and even more years old and still feel fresh and lively. So that's really the way we start with the first one. And when we bring these wines in and going back to the whole question of aging and oxygen and so forth, basically we don't want to allow too much oxygen to get into the wine early on. Um, oxygen, as you, oxidation, as you know, breaks down components. Um, it's a very radical process, but basically keeping fruitiness, which is what we love in wine, first and foremost, is a question of reducing the amount of oxygen. So should we taste the first one? Yeah, I was just going to say, and then when you open that bottle, it's important to get oxygen on that, on that glass. Um, I jokingly or half jokingly like to say that oxygen is a wine's friend until it's not. So I'm thinking specifically of after you've pulled that cork, as opposed to what Peter's saying is everything that's going in before you put that wine in the bottle. So um, a little uh, precursor to the 2008 Primos. 2008 was on, on the cooler side as a growing year. So what you get is less, depending on when you harvest, less high big ripe fruits and more acidity in that balance. And then that leans towards if you're picking at that sweet spot that Peter put on the chalkboard, what you end up with is a wine that's actually geared, that's actually um, from the impact of mother nature, uh, um, set up to age better over time. It's not set up to taste right out of the gate like a big ripe Pinot um, or a big ripe wine, no matter what that may be. And so as a result, you may see like in the last 10 or 15 years, there was a trend towards big overly ripe Cabernets that were, you know, full mouthful of fruit, not a lot of acid, and then maybe a lot of oak to kind of structure it. But over time, those wines don't do well. And then in, fall a, apart. Yeah, in a cooler year, you're going to naturally inherently see more of that acidity. And it's, if you're picking for balance, 
then you're going to see a, a longer, more, let's say, hopefully elegant aging profile. So as Douglas was saying, we just popped up the picture of Poseidon Vineyard. Uh, we, it's a gorgeous shot we took last um, fall, one of the smokeless days <laughs> in an otherwise bizarre and hot, tough vintage, but uh, up an airplane, it's just a gorgeous site. Everything you see there pretty much is all Poseidon Vineyard. Uh, as you can see, Carneros Creek is the riverbed on the left, which is where all the, the trees are, and then it runs in the Napa River. So two things here, lots of acidity because of the fog that comes off the San Pablo Bay in the background. And also, if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a little house there, and there's a hill, that's Primo's Hill. And that's one of the old geological banks of Carneros Creek. It's full of gravel. If any of you are fishermen and you go fly fishing, you go down a river and you see those those cut banks where there's a ton of gravel, that's an old cut bank. And lots of gravel means lots of fine roots, lots of fine roots means lots of tannin. And so even though Pinot is not a very tannic varietal, um, this site in Carneros has a lot of tannin and Carneros has this sort of dusty fruit tannin in it. And again, as we talked about in the beginning, tannin is a preservative. So we have two things going for us to make these wines age worthy. One, it's a cool site, so the acid stays high. Two, there's fairly a good amount of fruit tannin. Now, the third thing is when we actually bring it into the winery, and I'll go back up to the chalkboard. Tell us, coach. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, we put it into, coach is dropping the marker. Um, so we put it into a barrel. I'm gonna do my best approximation of a barrel, but luckily there's a real barrel or a couple of them behind you. Um, so why? Right, great question. We can actually make all the wine we want in stainless steel and we do. Most of these wines are actually fermented in stainless steel, but then they're put into barrel fairly early after fermentation. And in fact, the Chardonnay is very often fermented in the barrel. Barrels have tons of things in them. I remember uh, working, uh, as you guys may know, we, have an int we are half owners of a cooperage in Hungary with Tar and So. We work very closely with their their R&D team, and there are 400 compounds in wine and 400 compounds in oak. And all of these compounds mix in here. We have this diagram, which I'll spare you, that looks like how a nuclear reactor works. All of the various um, uh, chemistry, all the chemistry that happens inside the barrel. But the short answer is that our barrels are also a preservative. So barrels have two things in them. They have wood tannins, Right, um, but they are also, and this we only found out, um, they are antioxidants. They have antioxidant potential. So fruit tannin is one type of tannin. Wood tannin is another type of tannin. They're different tannins. They're very, very difficult to analyze. In fact, uh, there's, very, there's no laboratory in the world that can separate the two apart. But essentially wood tannins help, basically they're a very long chain molecule and they help bind color um, and other flavor fruit components in wine. So it's essentially the ancients figured out that wines that were aged in these oak barrels lasted a lot longer. So now the science is catching up. We have tons of analysis about it, but people have been using barrels for hundreds of years. So really the question is why? So the tannins were known, right? They preserve wine, but the oxygen, antioxidant, capacity was not known. So the R&D team in Bordeaux, um, we actually have this sort of submarine hatch capsule thing. We can put in a laser beam through a prism and measure oxygen throughout the wine. And what we have found is that actually new barrels, because of the amount of fresh wood that the wine is hitting here, new barrels digest a huge amount of oxygen out of the wine. This was a complete surprise. Everybody used to say, oh, barrels, they oxygenate the wine, they make them age longer and so forth. But wait a minute, the greatest wines in Burgundy, every year they had a really, really good vintage, they would put uh, them in 100% new barrels. They would not waste a bad vintage on, oh, they would not waste new barrels on a bad vintage. What they knew instinctively, not instinctively, but empirically rather, is that the wines that were in new barrels aged a lot longer. This has absolutely flipped barrel dogma on its head. Controversial, I know, I'm sure you've read about it in People Magazine, but <laughs> um, essentially there is no oxygen transfer in and out of a barrel. That's a myth. 
The only oxygen transfer is when you open the bung and you transfer wine in and out. But so it's if you, human interaction. But if you manage that, all right, basically you are creating a preservative environment for wine. So these wines basically had about a third new oak, um, I, roughly, I think in the early days. Cosmo Blaz actually was a bit more than that, maybe yeah, 100%, this, 100 no, I think this 08 was 100% new, new heavy So toast. this is now a 12-year-old wine. Um, and these are the two reasons, tannins and antioxidant capability. I won't bore you guys with too much of the details, but it's super cool. We take a stave in the laboratory and we put an electrode here, we put an electrode here. And the amount of time and speed, the resistance essentially across the oak, how long it takes is an exact correlation of how antioxidant is and the oxidative it is. Uh, what we have found is the oak from the Tokai region is the absolute densest oak that we know of in Europe and is also the most antioxidant in its capacity. So that's What's a little bit thing? about why the wine you're tasting right in front of you is still fresh I was yeah, just after 12 say, years. If I may, Peter, ask, so uh, just for those folks out there, what does that mean? Like, how does that translate into the, into the glass? Like if the, if the wine is, a, is or if, beg your pardon, if the oak is absorbing uh, oxygen out of the wine, what are we seeing? How is that impacting? I know that's a simple question, but how is that impacting the wine over time? Yeah, JJ, can you put us back on the other screen and I'll, I'll I'm, this is already looks like a, we, <laughs> looks like a wine Ouija board. Um, there's like a spirit will come out of that. Um, so first of all, if we are good at winemaking and if we are good at barrel making, you should not taste oak in this wine. Our palates have always, since the beginning of our biology, bio, evolutionary biology, have always been attracted to fruit and sweetness. Why? Because that fruit had the most calories, right? So we are biologically attuned to love sweetness. And so it doesn't matter, not everything we eat or drink is, but particularly with wine, the trick is, if it's just sweet, it's just not that interesting. So it, first, I want to just answer your question and say, we shouldn't taste any oak at all. All we should taste is the fact that this wine, after 12 years, is still reminding us of the sunshine and the fruit in 2008. It should be like taking a berry when you're in the vineyard and tasting it, and some shadow of that, or some evolution of that is a better word, should still be in this glass. So that's my, our first point about this is like, and by the way, it was probably, if I remember correctly, it was really good in 2010 and really good in 2012 and hopefully good in 2016. Now in 2021, we've, we've lived to tell the tale, but just barely that, um, that it's still tasting good. So it's not that there's a point of perfection of these wines. Um, there is a point where it starts to fall apart and nothing good lasts forever. Wines do degrade, the fruitiness to, to evolve. They have a lifespan. It has a lifespan. What we're talking about tonight is understanding why that progression happens and the different things you'll get out of it. If I may, to that point, there's something that I would, um, I probably should have prefaced this with, but hopefully you can still, you'll still be able to absorb, is that aging wines is not about finding a target date and then opening all of that wine on that target date. It's, it's not about the destination, not to sound too much like a, like hallmark a card. inspirational, <laughs> yeah, like a Hallmark card or an inspirational poster. Like a teamwork um, poster at right. <laughs> your, um, your, your last crappy job. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not about that. Um, but it is about the journey, you know, and it, it's about that, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, organic lifespan of that wine. And so, when I find something that I like wine wise, I want to buy multiples of it, not because I want to drink a bunch of it when it's mature, but because I want to track that I want I want to taste the trajectory, I want to have a relationship with that wine, if you will, that so that I'm trying it when it's young, and it's the fruit is big and the tannins are big and, and, and it's a little bit not hopefully not monolithic, but it, it, it has less of the subtlety and the depth and the layers that, um, that it has even just aromatically now with the 2008. Um, and certainly with the 2010 as well, there's, you know, for me, when I look at the wines, I can see these sort of um, concentric rings, uh, which, you know, you can call bricking or browning, 
um, where it goes literally from clear around the outside into kind of like a ruby or a garnet color in the center. And then there's all these different uh, levels of kind of from, from clear to bloody to rusty to, to um, like young and ripe in the center. That's not a bad thing. That doesn't mean the wine is bad. It means that it's mature. Um, so that just as an indicator, don't let that push you off of it. Um, that's part of the experience in the same way that smelling it is part of the experience over and over again, because it's going to change in the same way, as Peter mentioned earlier, you taste that wine, you know, my staff in the tasting room, they open a bottle of wine, they pour it for someone and that person loves it. Well, when they take it home, if they open it and immediately taste it, they may taste something different because my team has opened that at the start of the shift and has poured it once or twice. And then that person who comes at two o'clock in the afternoon is tasting a wine that's been open for six hours. Just within the lifespan of that single bottle, there are gonna be changes in that wine. So allow your wine some leeway and allow it some oxygen um, to open up for you. Um, yeah. so, so it's interesting, the, the, the irony is oxygen in the early part of a wine's life uh, will destroy it. In, in your glass, it'll wake it up. The oxygen that your wine gets as you open it, and that's why we use these wide, one of the reasons we use one of these wider glasses, or you decant wine if you use, typically don't decant Pinot, but you can, is it oxygen helps this wine wake back up. And that's why it may feel a little closed at the beginning of the meal, but by the end of the meal, it's much, bro much broader, much more expansive. It's certainly one of the ironies of how this wine chemistry works. But let's taste the next wine as an example. Oh, we have a question. A couple, couple questions before you move on. Yeah. Um, and remember to Fire remember away. To repeat them. Um, going back to the barrel. Um, <laughs> does a neutral barrel have Go the same on. antioxidant impact? Rate? No, it doesn't. Um, so the antioxidant impact, the, that, that whole thing goes like this. The first year has the most, and then second, then third, and fourth. Uh, but after four years, we consider a barrel neutral. Um, that's, the, that's the answer there. And then to clarify, so um, there's no evaporation in the barrel, so angel share is a myth. No. Uh, yes. Excellent. Distal. Very, very good uh, clarification. There is evapotranspiration out of the barrel. There is angel share. We actually have, sometimes you can hear our glycol chiller going to keep this cellar cool at around 50 degrees. If you go into the earth uh, more than five meters deep anywhere in the world, it's 10 degrees Celsius, which is 15 degree, 50 degrees. So cellars are always kept at roughly the earth's temperature. There's a long history of why that is. But nonetheless, um, what I was saying is that no oxygen is coming into the barrel through the staves to continue the deleterious effects of oxygenization in the barrel. So great point. Was there another? No, those, those are the two. All right. Okay, so the second one. Yeah, so I was just going to say with the, the I, I just feel like I have to mention it. I would, I would be, um, uh, it's a little disservice to this wine if I don't say this now, but the 2008, long before I worked for the guys, the 2008 Primo's Hill was my single favorite wine that, um, that they had produced. And um, it's not been confirmed, but I may have been the single greatest buyer of, of that. Um, it's, uh, but, and I have nothing to show for it anymore. It's pay to play here. Because, yeah, because, I, <laughs> because I've, I've consumed them. But, um, uh, and there's one or two of you maybe out there that have tried the, this wine with me because I, I've certainly sung its praises on a number of occasions. And it has a little kind of, for me, um, which is sort of softer now as it grows older, um, a very earthy, gamey, sort of soy, kind of savory, quality with the fruit that I really loved and that, that, that with the acidity that was a result of that cooler vintage seemed to fit just right in, in a way that was not overly ripe. Sometimes Carneros Pinos, because of, uh, of where they're grown, tend to have this um, uh, intense strawberry or sort of cherry pie um, sweetness to them. And that was one of the things that I loved about this wine. And, and I think that that was both a combination of the Hungarian oak, which is more sort of baking spice and savory in nature in as far as the aromatics that it has. Um, and along with that cooler year, and then the, the coolness of the vineyard as a result of the mean, marine layer that pulls in, we're the first to get it and the last to lose it because of where we're positioned and our vineyard is positioned. So that's sort of the dynamic for, for me anyway, of the 08 that had me crushing on it pretty hard for a long time. Um, and then this 2010 uh, Molnar family has like, for me, has brown sugar. Like I can smell the brown sugar on that. Um, 
in, in again, kind of more, I hate to say in a savory way, but if you could think of brown sugar in a savory kind of caramelized uh, way that, that, um, that you would want to pair with food, that's the one. I think that's, um, um, it's shining for me. That 2010 Molnar um, tastes pretty amazing right now. And tasting them side by side, it just brings up another point for me is that um, we taste in the matrix. Wines are like I mentioned earlier, like where we are, who are with, our body temperature. Are you are you tired? Is it evening? Is it is it later night, etc. All those things change. That's one thing. But the wines are also changing over time, as we're talking about. And typically, as a, as a wine gets older, the fruitiness component drops out. And what it does is it allows these other components to evolve, like D Douglas was talking about. Like we sometimes we talk mushroom or forest floor or soy. Typically, they're typically if you want to just make it a color, it's a brighter fruit. The strawberry, the raspberry, etc., tends to decline, and the sort of darker components of the wine come up. And and that's why the wine evolves like that over time. It's not one thing that dominates. It's a matrix of, matrix effects of all that coming together. So essentially, the fruit basis for these two wines are the same. The picking decisions were different. The 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 cause, the, the the Primo's Hill selection is a part of the hill, it tends to have smaller berries, et cetera, et cetera. But basically it's the same base material. It's the same within, within yards of each other. I mean, you can literally walk 20 vines and I can tell you this is what we picked for this first wine, this is what we picked for the second wine. So that doesn't have a huge amount of difference, but let's, let's talk here for a little while. There's a little bit of a warmer year. Uh, it's a little bit of a sweeter wine. It tends to have more sucrosité or, 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 or um, sweetness is a little bit, it's, it's a little bit um, more glycerin, um, but, but at the same time, it has more prominent bright fruit to it because it's a younger wine. Um, but it, and, it, and, and it's, that's, it's a great example to me of how this wine two years later can be, or two years, pick two years later, could be that much brighter. First off, I have to say, I'm glad you're, you clarified because when you said matrix, I thought I was gonna have to put cool shades on and start dodging bullets There's and a blip backwards. There's a blip. My back's too sore. I can't do. I can't do that. I can't do that. Um, but uh, that's a bad joke. Dad joke. Um, one of the other things I was going to say about 2010 as opposed to 2008. Both 10 and 11 were cooler years. That like 11 and 8 were roughly both cool years. 10 was it was cool for most of it, and then it had this. It was in in late mid mid September. It had like this burst. And like back in, in, in August, in certain areas, certainly I think with a lot of cab growers, it was so cool that people started pulling the leaf canopy, the shade that covered the fruit to get more sun and to get more air on them. And some of those people, when they went to harvest because they weren't expecting, there was no way to predict this, this uh, heat wave that, that came for, they had you know like three or four days in a row that were well over hundred degrees, kind of you know a heat spike. Um, they got fruit that looked good on the inside and then was sunburned on the outside. Um, we kind of managed to miss that with the Pinot Noir because it, it came off right in that time, but we were able to take advantage of, of that heat spike. So when we did harvest it, it was riper and rounder, but it also had the benefit of this long, cool um, growing pattern uh, preceding that. So, Which mainly means that because it was cool before, there was still a lot of acidity in the grape. Right, so you need to have acid breaks down when the grape gets hotter than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And one of the nice things about where we are is the San Francisco Bay is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit most of the time. And so when the fog comes in, it basically, it's like taking your whole vineyard and sticking it in the refrigerator. All of our fridges are around 48 or whatever the degrees are. It, acid stops metabolizing. And having cool nights is the signature of every great wine region in the world, whether it's Burgundy or whether it's Bordeaux because it's near the ocean or whether it's up high up on the mountains or whether it's in Canada, that's a different topic for another day. But even though we would have a hot day, as Douglas was saying, the base chemistry of the grape was still sound, which means we got some sugar, yes, but we picked it in time and the fruit has enough acidity for a relatively short aging wine like Pinot as opposed to Cabernet, which is longer aging for lots of reasons. This is still a super fresh wine. It's 10 years old. I haven't had this for at least five or six years. It's drinking pretty good. I hope that some of you have this at home because it's, it's showing really well. And it's, um, 
Yeah, it's it's putting a smile on my face. It reminds me that um, just recently, last weekend, actually, there's uh, a couple, uh, some of our members that are on this call, I hope they made it, uh, John and Catherine, that this is kind of their first time, certainly John's first time of, of tasting in this manner. He's kind of transitioning from beer to wine. So we want to support you. Don't, I don't, don't give up beer. <laughs> <laughs> What's that joke? There's a, there's a silly joke about it takes a lot of- it Takes a lot of beer to make good wine. Yeah. So yeah, a mix. We, 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 we encourage you to uh, a mix. Don't mix them in the same glass, but- Just you know. water, just keep away from water. <laughs> Unless there's a fire. So um, yeah, welcome to this. I hope that you're getting the most out of it. I hope that this is, um, that this is uh, living up to expectation. Um, and with that in mind, the, the third and final wine is- Oh our, yeah, before, before we go forward, there's a question. Oh, question's great. Can you guys explain why wine spent a longer time in barrels because there's three of our grand reserve bottles that take longer to get ready to drink and last longer? Yeah, uh, did everybody hear that question? So the question was, why do wines that are aged really for a very long time in oaks, such as Grand Reserva from Rioja, um, take longer to drink? Um, it's a, it's, it's a co more complicated question than you would imagine, but essentially, um, if it's on oak for a long time, those oak tannins that we were talking about beforehand, they need a certain amount of time to integrate. That's really what, so those, those 800 compounds or 400 compounds of grapes and the 400 compounds of wines, they do come together in the barrel, but we really wait for integration. Um, and if you have really big, robust wines, there's a lot of compounds coming out of the grapes and there's a lot of compounds coming out of the barrels because they're in for so long, they need a longer time to integrate and to become essentially smooth, right? I mean, there's no better word for it. Like, Does that break down? Well, I mean, no, they chain up. They chain up um, and those compounds become long and then they slowly break down as the wine ages. But those, those compounds, chaining up or, or compounding or whatever the right chemistry is, I'm blanking on it right now, but that's why those wines become really big, really robust, and they say, take some time to mellow out, essentially become smooth and really drinkable. And they last forever because they have tons of stuffing. Um, can you share sort of the typical progression of the length of time that, that our wines, and it probably varies by variety, spends in steel versus um, new oak or versus old oak? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so that question was um, in terms of the our wines, uh, the the person who's asking the question is looking for um, detail in regards to um, how long in general, let's say, how long do our wines spend in 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 tank and stainless steel tank, and then in barrel, uh, and then in bottle, and then served. Um, they, it does depend on, on the varietal, but uh, in a general sense, if I may, I'll take a whack at it and then yeah. correct me where I'm off. But in, in general, um, the, the fruit will come in and it will spend anywhere, let's say roughly two weeks, but 10 to 15 days roughly in stainless steel tank during fermentation. And then from at the very end of that alcoholic fermentation, it gets moved, um, in most cases, it would get moved to barrel. Uh, in, in some cases there, well, in, in all cases, there's a percentage of varied percentage of new oak. So that can be as much as, uh, with our Boonfly Chardonnay, let's say, or our half mile, that's hundred percent of those barrels are new. Um, and then they can be all the way down to some wines where we've produced some, where we're using nothing but neutral barrels. So those are barrels that have been used enough times. They've been leached of those compounds that Peter was talking about earlier. So they're not, it's, it's a storage vessel, a neutral storage vessel, as opposed to imparting oak flavor or oak chemical to the wine. Um, and that process can be anywhere from as short as three months, but usually for us, the, the, the span is about eight and a half, nine months up to two years. Um, and then uh, from that point, we then Put, bring it to a blending tank so that about goes all back into stainless steel so that we can make all those barrels kind of homogenized to the best of our abilities and then you bottle from that blending tank if that does that feel about yeah. right? and the logic behind all of that is like cooking you would never just use one spice in a dish obviously we most dishes have salt and pepper in the western cuisine and then we add thyme or or oregano or uh, curry or I mean there's a bunch of different things we do I'm a big but, fan of cumin I use cumin and everything exactly I love cumin too well. eggs. just kidding so 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 essentially by putting wine into barrels that are both either new 
second year, third year, or neutral, putting them in for three months or six months or 18 months or 24 months. Even if it's the same wine, like these were the same wine, this was 100% new, this was 30% new. Um, it gives the team and Alex, our winemaker, a series of different flavors and build layers in a wine. So some of the neutral barrels are super bright, like, cause they have no oak in them at all. They're just all really, really bright fruit. Um, the new barrels are much sweeter, have much more stuffing. They're more tannic, a bunch of different things. You know, themselves, they're not necessarily great, but then we'll sit down and we'll do what essentially a bench trial and we'll just taste these things through, through. So it's not like trying to find the perfect blend because we would be like a cat video. Like we would be a cat chasing its own tail. We would, we would never be able to find the perfect, um, the right aging, the right barrel, the right time in we any one year because every year changes. We have different acidity, we have different sugar, we have the heat waves that come sometimes, sometimes it's underripe. But what it gives us over time is just a series of options. And, and by the time the next spring rolls around, we sit and taste them and the springs are when the wine wakes up. Like, oh, well, this will probably be good with this and this will probably be good with that. If anybody remembers the old Reese's Pieces commercials um, back in the day, it's really trying to say like, oh, that's it. Like that's the combination that really tastes really well. And so it's not a formula. Um, it's a series of setting ourselves up for the success of being able to blend a good wine later on. You're kind of making it sound like this whole thing's subjective. It is very subjective. <laughs> a question. There's yeah, a question. There's a question. There's a question. There's a question. Super question. These are dungeons. When we act up, Peter or Arvad put us yeah. in there. Not for too long, just long enough. We so have, everybody's well behaved. As we well. have we have a very very old tradition in Central Europe um, and throughout Europe, where much all winemaking came from originally. But um, is age is cask aging, and um, in in the last fifty years we moved away from it. Uh, they were considered a little dirty, hard to clean. The wines weren't as bright, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons we went to stainless steel. The reality is, is stainless steel is a fantastic tool, but it's not a vessel. When we talk about a tank, like a stainless steel tank, that's just a tool where we put stuff. It's like having your nice old, uh, you know, your metal bowl when you're baking at home. It's great to use, but it doesn't have either soul or it doesn't impart flavor. Now, uh, casks, they are the oldest way of making wine. And what we found in the past years is that the wines that come out of casks have a very different character to them. And so what we're doing here is our very first Chardonnay and our very first Pinot Noir that's done almost entirely in casks. They were, they were fermented, as Doug was mentioned, in stainless steel, but they're aging in casks and they're awesome. We are really, really happy with them. Over behind Douglas is a, is, a, is a tank. We call it oak tank. And, and um, we are aging our Cabernets in these. Um, and again, it's a very different evolution of the same fruit. We'll often blend these wines with barrels. And it goes back to what I was talking about, like giving ourselves components to build wines that have layers to them and certain complexity. Um, and it's just another, again, another expression of really good fruit. Like, always, always, we're just saying like, what's gonna make this fruit taste really good? Like, what's gonna make it taste more, more bright? What's gonna make it taste more, more sweet? What's gonna make it last longer? Like, those are all the things we're thinking about all the time. I, I would say one of the things- that's, Plus they're super beautiful. Yeah. I mean, they really are. They look good. That's pieces all of, They're pieces of art. Look good. Um, one of the things that I would say as, as someone who's tasted these two wines, one of the things that, that, that I noted was that this larger vessel, there's a freshness to the wine as a result. And um, as I understand it, that's because of the relationship between volume, liquid volume to surface area. And so in contrast to one of the um, smaller, like 60 gallon barrels. Uh, which are these that we're standing which, yeah, in front of. These guys, you have quite a bit more surface area in relationship to volume. Whereas this, you've kind of blown that ratio uh, you know, I was going to say out of the water, but it's yeah. corny to say out of the wine. Um, but what you get as a result is this, this uh, bright, fresh, um, 
I don't want to say fruit forward because people have an, an idea of what that means, but it really is fruit right up front. And, and it's an, it feels accurate and, and, um, and fresh. So, so I mean, th keep that's, your eye out for it. that's um, if you guys look at these barrels here, these are the barrels, as we mentioned before, there was a question, this, this barrel after four years will be neutral. Uh, you can still use it. A lot of in, in Grand Reserve or Rioja, they'll use barrels for 30, 40 years sometimes. This tank we'll use for decades, right? So we're not looking for oak impact. We're not looking for the antioxidant properties in it. We're basically looking for how a wine will evolve in a wooden, in a wooden um, vessel versus a stainless steel vessel. So we age in these like we would in a stainless steel tank, but it tastes a lot better than a stainless steel tank. Um, it, it, stainless steel tanks are pretty sterile. This is not sterile. This has a biome in it. The wood has some impact. There is some oxidation because of the way uh, we move the wine in and out of it. So it's a very different expression. But yeah, question. Before you guys move on, so the, the 2010 Pinot, on one hand, it tasted wonderful, but they were worried because the nose was musty and wet, kind of woody. Can you comment on that? Interesting. Uh, well, I'm not there to, the, the, the question was in regards to the 10, uh, Pinot Noir, their, uh, their perception of the nose, the way it smelled, was woody and, uh, and musty, they said. Um, I would narrow it down really quickly into two categories. Um, either uh, that bottle has, uh, is not good, which is possible after 10 years, it's possible, in which case bring it to the tasting room and I'll swap it out. Um, but it, it, it's also possible, like with this bottle, when we first open it, it had an earthiness. It had like, a, well, they'll say like forest floor, like wet leaves or yeah. um, like a funkiness to it. And that's um, both characteristic of Pinot that's aging. Um, and, and also when you just open a bottle, there's, uh, you have to, they'll say, you know, let it blow off. It'll blow off, which is also sounds like an excuse for uh, a lousy wine, but um, I've heard that made. But in this case, I would say um, uh, taste the fruit. And if the fruit feels right to you when it's on your palate, then keep smelling that wine and keep going back to it and notice how it changes. If that funkiness is unappealing and doesn't change, then you've got, some, then, then you've got an off bottle. But in most cases, what you'll find more often than not is that it starts to open up and then you start to smell those caramelized um, you know, like the brown sugar that I was talking about earlier, and a little bit of this sort of grippy uh, um, tannin and, and uh, meatiness. Uh, so hopefully that's the, that's the way that that wine will go. So remember, this wine has been in a bottle closed up for 10 years with almost no oxygen. There's a little bit through the cork and there's a lot of debate about that, but nonetheless, um, it will need some time to wake up very often. And what you'll get first is that earthy character as Douglas was talking about. Bunk. This is very, very typical with Burgundies. If, if you drink them in the first hour, you've ruined the whole experience because they <laughs> really just pop out of the glass in hour two. Now, um, this could be, there's lots of other reasons. It could, be, it could be a bad cork, it could be a bunch of different things, but that's very typical for any wine that you've had in a bottle for 10 years. I mean, you know, Think how you feel after a long nap, you know? <laughs> it's like, I'm it takes a little while to kind of trick. <laughs> yeah, imagine if you, were the, if you were the genie that was forced in that bottle, you'd be a little like, cranky. It's like when you have Sunday morning, you know, after you slept in. So, so I think there's a little bit of that to that too. I would agree. Is there another one there? Nope. Okay. So Sorry. then I'm gonna um, roll into the, into the last wine, which as I mentioned before, might seem a little unconventional for some of you because there's this sort of preconceived uh, notion that we drink whites first and then we go to reds. Um, we did this on purpose uh, in, in, in this tasting um, for a couple of reasons. One, because we wanted to mix it up for you. And two, because having that Chardonnay at the end, there's a sweetness and um, uh, to the Chardonnay, which would coat your palate and potentially get in the way of, of tasting the full flavors of the Pinot, especially because I don't know what you got going on at home, but for us, as you can see, um, well, I guess Peter has an eraser and some pens on the, on the top of his, but I don't know that those are really adequate food pairs. So they're not really going to cleanse your palate. I mean, you could try, but yeah, oh, no, exactly please, they're, they're, they're scented. <laughs> I think. Please, no. He's sniffing the pens. He's sniffing the pens. 
So with- um, It's been a long year. <laughs> <laughs> with this Chardonnay, uh, it's, it's perfect to, and it's still considered, I guess, a library wine at, at five years. It's had some time in the barrel, or in the barrel, but also in the bottle. Um, and three to five years is really a sweet spot for our Chardonnays. I encourage people to hold on to those wines for that period of time. Most people do not. The overwhelming majority of Americans are consuming their wine within 24 hours of that purchase. Doesn't mean that those are uh, all newly released wines. You can certainly go to the store and buy an old wine and, and open it up for dinner, and loads of people do. But the, the idea, that trend is people are not holding, it, holding on to it in a way that allows them the opportunity to taste what's really actually there. Um, and so maybe, uh, maybe wine trends in far, in far as production have really leaned in that direction for that immediate gratification. And there are a number of, of producers that really gear what they show, what they put in the bottle towards an earlier uh, consumption. And as a result, you can't have both, you can't have it both ways. You can't have in my opinion, you can't have a really amazing young drinking wine that's also going to go the distance with longevity. You have there are trade offs that need to be made, and so it's really fun um, for for us anyway to see that there are really clear windows of indication um, as to the mature maturity of our of our wines. And with our Chardonnays, I recommend three to five years with the estate with our bench. Um, and at least that with the Boonfly, I would say the Boonfly is maybe more like five to eight. And even still, we have 12 year old versions of the 2008 of our Boonfly Chardonnay is it's kicking. I mean, it's still alive, which for Carnero Chardonnay is kind of unheard of. We're, we're in rare, we're in rare company there. Um, there's maybe a couple other producers that do that could even claim that they would do that consistently. Um, so with this wine, we're looking at five years. It, much in the same way in, in the barrel uh, new oak exposure as the as the Pinot before it, it sees roughly 25% new oak, which means that a quarter of the barrels that we use in the making of this wine are new. The other 75% are neutral. So it's not a heavy handed oak program. And it spends about eh, eight and a half, nine months in the barrel before we put this in the bottle. Yes, a question. Does that three to five year window hold true for the sea change? Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it could, however, what, I, oh, I have to repeat that question. So the question was, does the three to five year window that I named for our Chardonnays apply to our sea change Chardonnay as well? And our sea change Chardonnay is, uh, is a wine that we make that, that sees no new oak and it uh, does not go through secondary fermentation. So the native acid, the malic acid uh, that's native to the grape is not converted to lactic acid, which is that process malolactic fermentation, which is that process that, that actually um, provides the creaminess or the butteriness in Chardonnay. Um, it's also, you know, 99.9% .9 of reds go through that um, process, but that's not really showcased. And we don't have to talk about that now. But um, so in the sea changes case, you have a very crisp, bright, fresh, um, more citrusy and, and kind of floral um, modern version of Chardonnay. And that is fresh right out of the gate. You're not aging it is not, it's going to change those components. It's going to smell more interesting and, 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 and mature. But what's inherently best about that wine, I think is that fresh new feeling and so you're not going to get any fresher or any newer by holding on to it. So it's really one of those wines that I think, yeah, absolutely experiment, keep a couple bottles, but don't keep all of what you've got in, in hopes of it improving. Because I think what's really special about that wine is what you get right out of the gate. Is that? Yeah. I, and I was just thinking about the progression that we, Douglas had the idea of doing the reds first and the whites. I, I'll tell you that wine professionals, barrel reps, wineries around the world have moved in the last decade for tasting the reds first and the whites last. Partly our, our, our palate gets fatigued as we taste more wines. Uh, there are more components in reds and there are fewer in whites. Whites tend to be a bit more refreshing. Um, also, it gives uh, the role that whites should have, which are they are beautiful substantive wines. We have a bias towards sort of bigger red wines culturally and even winemakers do this. Um, but anyway, it's, a, it's, it's something we do. Um, 
you know, to, your, to, to the question about the sea change versus this is a great one. The core part of this is the site. This grape, these, this grapes, blah, these grapes have a lot of acidity and they're gonna last no matter what we do with them. I mean, unless we totally screw it up in the winery and give it way too much <laughs> oxygen, we're going to, they're going to last a, a good amount of time. Now, the wines like the Boonfly um, Chardonnay, which is under 100% new oak, that, that's a wine that can last almost 20 years, ideally. Um, I wouldn't wait for 20 years for this wine. And that's because it has 100% new oak. This is 30% new oak. So those are the kinds of decisions that we make. So, question. We should talk decanting. Which wine should you decant and when should you decant them for service? We should talk decanting. Which wine should you decant and when should you decant them before service? Um, I wouldn't decant any of these wines. Uh, as a rule, um, and you know, rules are made to be broken and you know, I, I encourage experimentation. And here's the thing, if putting them in a, in a decanter makes you happy, that's really Go all that it. matters. Go for it, you know? I, I, I know someone who likes to pour a glass out, put the cork back in and shake it like it's, like it's a martini. I wouldn't do that, but like for them, it sort of demystifies and, and it, and, 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 and yeah, it definitely, yeah, they call it the poor man's, the poor man's aerator. Um, I think whatever helps you to appreciate and enjoy the experience, by all means, that's what you should do. Um, classically, you are going to, um, you're going to decant new young wines in a more aggressive style to aerate them and allow them to open up much to what Peter was saying earlier about, about getting that oxygen in and, and, and allowing those, those flavors and aromas, esters to, all that to release. Um, and then you're also decanting with an old wine. So with a new wine, I'll go through that really quickly. With a new wine, you're aggressive and you're shaking it around a bit. And maybe you're, you're doing that as, you know, as soon as right before you're gonna drink it or uh, in advance by like an hour or two. Um, I certainly wouldn't decant something young like that and then leave it all day in a decanter. Um, I might pull the cork and, and leave it all day with just the cork out and then decant it and drink it. But um, I, you know, you're not gonna shake it around and, and expect it to be fresh hours, hours later, maybe one or two. With an older wine, you're decanting not just to open it up, but also to prevent sediment from, from, uh, from mixing in, in that, into that decanter and then uh, in your glass, because that will affect the flavor. Some people pretend they like it. I'm not a big fan. Um, and then that's why you see the little, the little uh, candle underneath, and you know, then you'll see someone yeah. watching the neck of the bottle. They're like an old Pink Panther movie. Yeah. They have those. <laughs> for silt. Um, and then they'll also watch the neck of the decanter as that wine goes down, and they're they're watching for silt particles so that they can so that they can cool the pour. And when you do that. Once you start pouring, you don't want to stop. You want to keep a continuous stream and you watch that, that candlelight through that narrow uh, um, like uh, uh, little river, little creek of, of, of wine that comes through so you can watch for silt. Um, and that's really as much about preventing silt from get sediment as it is to open up that wine. Because if you're opening something old like that, you really, as Peter was saying earlier, you really want to enjoy it. Each one of those glasses that you have throughout the age of that bottle, you want to savor and take your time and let those uh, aromas and flavors come out. Um, so you don't want to cheat yourself of that. I would, two things I would just add. If you're, if you're pouring the bottle in one go to a group of six people, that having it out of one decanter helps age that wine a little bit earlier. If it's just you and your partner at home, just what, pour it out of the bottle and watch it evolve in the glass. That's just one thing. The other thing I would just mention is temperature. Um, going back to that, we really biologically love fruit. Typically wines should be a little bit cool. They should be around 50, 55 degrees, even the reds. The joke is that we, we drink, in America, we drink our whites too cold and our reds too warm. A lot of wines, especially older wines, if you chill them for a little bit, I sometimes eat Capino, I'll stick it in the fridge for 20 minutes, it'll just get the temperature down enough and it'll really bring out the, the fruit. Because when I was talking about the matrix effect again, if it, the wine's warm, the alcohol is gonna come off of it first, right? Because alcohol really vaporizes very quickly, um, aerosols very quickly, and that's when you kind of get that hot feeling so I would just say, even if you don't decant these wines, chill them a little bit, 
They're going to warm up in your glass. They're going to warm up in the, uh, don't put them in the fridge in the morning and come home. They, they, that'll bottle, that'll cold shock them. But that's a really big part, especially with, with more delicate reds and especially with cheap wines. You can make a $15 bottle taste like a $25 bottle by sticking in the fridge for 20 minutes. I, I kid put you that not. Put on a t-shirt. I kid you not. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's because suddenly you're going to be tasting fruit and not alcohol and not the other things that are a little not that, that, that great. It's like, it's, like, it's like dimming the lights. That's <laughs> that's everything was, my, everything my, was better. Lights everything lights was better in dim lights. <laughs> dim them to I mean, these lights are too. These lights are too strong. Um, one thing I was just going to say really quickly about aging wine is that it's a common misconception, but you can't take a crappy wine and hold on to it and make it a good wine. This is you know aging is does got to be good for the start. Yeah, aging does not does not forgive faults. Um, so it's something, and that's, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier about you buy multiples and then you taste it along the way. It's an experience along the way. And then you find that spot where it speaks to you. It's not, it's not about knowing where that target destination is and then just holding on to it to that point. So, um, I think that that's a really important thing. Like you can't buy a, a, a $10 bottle, hold on yeah, to yeah, it for 10 that, years yeah. and it's suddenly a hundred dollar bottle. It doesn't work like that. We have that. another question. Oh, are we on another time? Probably, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I mean, all compounds start to break down, so resveratrol sure probably should as well over time. I, whether it's determined enough in terms of the health benefits and all the rest, I have no idea. But I, I want to finish with a with a story about aging wine. And one of the things I um, we've talked a lot of technical things, but here's what I would tell you. Think about something really great that happened to you in 2008 or in your family in 2010 or in 2000, I believe, 15, 16, 16 right? Um, because I think one of the great things about wine is its ability to be nostalgic and to go back. I'm like, oh, I remember that year and this happened, like kid graduated from high school or, you know, we got married or whatever it is, because that really, to me, uh, speaks about the the vintage of the year, like it's, it's not a technical, this is not an object, it's an experience. And that year was an experience. And our turn around the sun that year was an experience for all of us, everybody had their own different experience. So this year was a very common experience, obviously with COVID. But I wanna give you guys an example of this. And I, I arrived in Budapest in 1990, the wall came down, our family was from there originally. Our uncle had stayed behind, he was 13 during the revolution, didn't go out. And he became a big wine aficionado and Hungary has a very long and old history and he reconstituted this group called the Seven Wine Judges. Long story short, in the southern part of the country in Vilan is a volcanic region. And there was a big wine trading company. They were, it, was a, it was a Schwab community, which is Germanic origin, who settled there three or 400 years ago. Anyway, this electrician was working on a cellar and he noticed there was a wire that went past the end of the cellar, like a brick wall. And he, and he kind of knocked on the wall and it was somewhat hollow and he opened it up and behind there, there were two or 3,000 bottles that had been there since the Second World War. And because the Nazis and the, and the Soviets later came through that area, um, the, the, the family was a prominent wine trading family, had hidden their best bottles, but they had moved or died or been killed or nobody knows. I, did, I didn't know the story at the time. At that time, I was the thinnest member of the group, which was a little while ago. And so <laughs> they put us in this one, piece, this one piece working suit. We went down and I crawled through this sort of hold this big and we had this big light set up like these lights here and of the 3,000 bottles about half of them the, the the vines um the corks had disintegrated and the wines had poured out but about half of them they were so i carefully took the bottles and i handed them back there were a couple other guys who were helping we had rotations and the oldest bottle we found was 1896 and it was a white wine and we very carefully opened the cork and poured it out and this was in 1991. And I just sat there and it was drinkable. And I was like, oh my God, I am drinking fruit from a summer that happened almost a hundred years ago from that sunlight that ripened that vine that created this grape. And that, and it, was, it was not a wine anymore, really. It was a, it was a wisp of the wine that it was, but, it, it just struck me that I am drinking something 
from the sunlight of the eight, late 1800s. And so these wines are not that old. We're not that old. Uh, hopefully you didn't have to crawl through an old brick wall to get to these wines. But my point is- set that up if you exactly. want. <laughs> my point is like, I think a lot of this question about when's a good time to drink wine. Sometimes you just walk downstairs and you have an old box of wine. If you're, if you have, if you're fancy, you have a cellar, but a lot of us just have boxes of wine in the basement and you pull out a wine, you're like, 2014, that was a hell of a good year. I think I'm gonna drink this wine tonight. And that's as, as much as thought as you should give it. The rest of it is great. And it makes the wine more understandable and so forth. And hopefully our job is to make that wine so that the 2014 is still good. Um, but really ultimately this is an experience that you should have with that wine and with the people you're drinking with. And that's about all I gotta say about that. Well said. So with that in mind, uh, unless there are any further questions, we'll say thank you very, very much for tuning in. We hope that you, if you didn't learn something, we hope that you enjoyed the time and we look forward to, we'll be doing this uh, the third Friday uh, in March and we'll be focusing on uh, wines that we will be releasing as part of our spring wine club shipment. So we've got some really fun stuff, including new labels and some fabulous fun stuff that, that we'll be uh, tasting and pouring for you then. So until that point, thanks for tuning in and have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Cheers, cheers.